Good to see all of you here tonight. It's good also to have everybody that's joining us online. Um, it does feel a little bit different. I don't know if it does for you, but just it's uh, very light in here. <laughs> Normally it's dark when we're getting started, but uh, yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, most of you know me, but my name is Chad White. I'm a staff minister here at Holy Word. In 1995, <clears throat> very, uh, there was a movie that was very, very popular. And uh, in fact, it was nominated for 10 Academy Awards, of which it won five. Uh, does anybody want to take a guess at what that movie was? You, I guess you maybe have to be a movie buff to just get it from that information. A movie called Braveheart. How many of you have seen the, the movie before? Okay, so quite a few of you have. So, <clears throat> a little bit of a spoiler alert, okay? Um, but if you haven't seen it, you should. It's, it's a really good movie. Uh, it, do, it does get a little violent at times, but, but it's, it's a really good movie. Uh, it's a movie about a man uh, named William Wallace, and I think it's loosely based on a true story as well. A man named William Wallace, he was a 13th century uh, Scottish warrior, and he uh, got the support of his fellow countrymen, and he led uh, rebellions and uh, war against England, and specifically against England's king, uh, a man that they called Longshanks. And uh, England was oppressing them and abusing them, and, and they just they wanted to be their own nation. Scotland did. Uh, at one point during the movie, uh, William Wallace uh, garners the support of some of the nobles, and, and they were friends of his. And uh, one of them is a, na- a guy by the name of Robert de Bruce, and he's actually uh, potentially in line to be the king of Scotland when they, when they become a nation. So they all get together, and, and all the men, and they go out and they bat, do battle against England. And by the way, I should say, so William has been winning, uh, and his men, they've been winning some battles against England and kind of being a thorn in their side. So these nobles, Robert the Bruce and William Wallace, go with their men, and they go out to, to battle England in a place called Falkirk. And uh, two of the nobles during the battle, or at the beginning of the battle, pull out, and they pull their men out. Uh, they've either gotten in cahoots with Longshanks or they're, they're fearing that something will happen to them. So they pull out, and the battle does not go very well. And, uh, and William Wallace, is, uh, he's injured, and you know, his army is not doing well. They're losing the battle. And there's a, a, an iconic scene where he is, he's on horseback, and he's chasing after these Englishmen. And he catches up to them. And one of them turns around and, uh, to, to face him, and he has a, a helmet on, so you can't see his face. And uh, they, they battle, and, and, and in time, William gets him down on the ground. He has his knife out, and he's, he's going to kill him. And he pulls, he grabs the base of his helmet, and he rips it off. And when he does, it's Robert the Bruce, his friend and the noble that had said he would go to war with him. And William stumbles back on the ground, uh, and the the look on his face, as he looks into Robert's face, and Robert's looking back at him, is one of bewilderment and disappointment and sadness you can imagine. And and William Wallace, he, he actually lays back on the ground almost like he's just giving up. He's so, uh, he's so hit emotionally by what's happened. <clears throat> Robert the Bruce betrayed his friend, William Wallace. Betrayal is, is always a bad thing, but betrayal of a friend is the worst. There's no greater betrayal than that of a friend. There's a phrase that says, the, the, the greater the friendship, or the greater the trust, the deeper the hurt when there's betrayal. Um, and Robert the Bruce betrayed uh, William Wallace. What he did is what Peter did to Jesus in the verses that we're going to look at tonight. They come from Mark chapter 14. I'm going to give you a little bit of background to the text before we look at it. So these, these events 
occur early on Friday morning, good, the first Good Friday. Uh, it's probably still dark. Uh, just earlier that evening, well, in, on Thursday evening before, Jesus had spent uh, the evening with his disciples, with Peter and the other disciples. They had celebrated the Passover together, and Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. And there's a lot of things that he told his disciples that night. And one of the things that he told them is that all of them would abandon him as, as events uh, transpired that evening and things started happening to Jesus, that they would all flee. And he also specifically told Peter, he said, he said, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. And what that means is that Satan wanted to uh, attack Peter's faith so forcefully that he would maybe fall away. And Peter, in response to all that, to Jesus' face, says, he says, Jesus, even, even if all these other guys fall away, which it was really condescending when you think about it, he said, if, even if all these other guys fall away, he says, I will never fall away. He says, even I, if I have to die, Jesus, I will never deny you. I will never disown you. And Jesus said to him, he said, Peter, before the rooster crows twice, you're going to disown me three times. So, um, Peter, again, said these words to Jesus, and uh, they, they leave, they spend some more time together. Uh, by the way, P Jesus also said he was going to pray for Peter, that he would pray for him because of, of what was going to happen um, so they leave there, they go out to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is arrested by the, the temple guards, and they take him to the palace of Caiaphas, who is the high priest at that time. And, uh, oh, also I should say, all the disciples, they did flee <laughs> when Jesus got arrested. They, they abandoned him, just as, Peter, as Jesus had said. So they take Jesus to Caiaphas, and Peter and John follow at a distance, but they get into the courtyard of the palace of Caiaphas. John had a, uh, uh, some connections with the high priest, so they're allowed to go in. And uh, we don't hear what, what happened to John, but we do hear what happens to Peter. And, and that's our text for tonight. So uh, you can open up the Pew Bible if you want to and turn to Mark's Gospel. Otherwise, you can, just, uh, you can just follow along. This is Mark chapter 14, starting at verse 66. It says, While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and he went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, This fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and he wept. So there's a lot about <clears throat> this, uh, this little scene that is just not good. It just stinks. <laughs> One of them is that, uh, I mean, sure, Peter and John are concerned about Jesus and they're wanting to you know, see what's going on and follow what's kind of happening to Jesus, but they really put themselves not in a, a good situation. In fact, you'd say in really a bad situation in the courtyard of the high priest. So most of the people that are going to be there are enemies of Jesus and his followers. And it's very likely that the guards, the temple guards that arrested Jesus in the garden are also in that courtyard. So you got to wonder, did they not think that maybe they would be recognized among Jesus' enemies, that maybe something could go badly here? Um, also, you kind of wonder why Peter 
after the first accusation, why didn't he leave? Why didn't he hightail it out of there? Um, did he think that maybe they weren't going to recognize him if he just went to a different part of the courtyard? Or maybe he thought he'd just lie his way through it again. And when you watch, as we watch the, the events unfold here, and you think back to what Peter said to Jesus, it really, really makes Peter's words sound silly and, and arrogant and foolish. Because remember, he had told Jesus, he said, Jesus, even if all these other guys deny you or, or abandon you, I will never do that. In fact, I will die for you, Jesus, before I do that. And what did it take here in this courtyard? A, a little accusation from a servant girl. And it wasn't like Jesus hadn't told his disciples, including Peter, what was going to happen to him. Right? He, he had told them a number of times that he was going to go to Jerusalem, that he would suffer at the hands of the Jewish leaders. He also told them that they too would suffer that they would have to pick up their own cross in following him. But yet here, at, at even the, the slightest possibility of suffering, Peter lies, he denies it, he'll do whatever, he does whatever he can to avoid even the slightest bit of suffering. In, in a moment when Jesus needed his friends. <clears throat> In a moment when Jesus should have stood up and confessed for his friend and owned his friend and even been willing to be in the court to testify for his friend, he denied that he even knew him. You know, it's one thing to watch in the passion, in, the, in our Lord's passion, to watch his enemies, and the, 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 just the vile, inexcusable things that they do, right? The, the high priest, the, the Sanhedrin, the, the, the Jewish high council, the, the guards. To see his enemies do that is bad enough, but to see his friend, a very dear friend, deny that he even knew him. Someone that said he loved him and served him. Peter betrayed Jesus. And it was awful. Just think about how you and I have betrayed Jesus. Whenever we have, like Peter, not listened to Jesus' words when we should have or forgot words that Jesus told us, we're betraying Jesus. Whenever we decide to blend in with the crowd instead of in a moment where we should stand up for and speak up for Jesus as a follower of Christ, we're betraying Jesus. Whenever we Fear more what other people think than what God thinks. We're betraying Jesus. Whenever we in our heart tell Jesus that we're going to do something and we don't, we're betraying Jesus. When we, like Peter, lie or deny in order to get out of even just the slightest bit of suffering when trials come, we're betraying Jesus. You've betrayed Jesus, I've betrayed Jesus. We've, we've all betrayed Jesus. And why? You know, why, why? Why do we do that? Why, why do we betray a friend? Why do we betray our friend, Jesus? It's because we're all self-centered. We care more about saving ourselves, especially when the, time, when the tough times come, than others. 
We place more value in ourselves than in the friendship or the friend or Jesus. After Peter denied Jesus the third time, it says the rooster crowed. It doesn't tell us here in this gospel, but in Luke's gospel, it also says that at that very moment, Jesus looked right at Peter. And, they, and Peter caught his glance, and they looked at each other, looked at each other's face. Jesus, by the way, was, was coming out of the, the mockery of a trial that, they, that he was in front of the Jewish high council. And uh, he was beaten, bruised, bloody, probably spit in his face. That's the face that Peter saw. What do, you, what do you think was going through his mind? What do you think was on his heart when he saw Jesus' face? You think that maybe he wasn't just thinking about the words he had said earlier, but maybe a lot of other words that Jesus had said? Maybe all the time that he had spent with Jesus, all in that one moment, it was all flashing before him, all the things that Jesus had done for him, all the promises that Jesus had made. Do you think when, when Peter looked at Jesus that he saw disappointment or compassion, maybe, or love? Maybe all of it <laughs> together? It says when Peter, between the, the rooster crowing, G, Peter looking at Jesus' face, and him recalling the words that Jesus had said, it says that Peter broke down and he wept bitterly. And, and maybe it's obvious, but this was no just short passing cry. This was a deep weeping. He was grieved by what he had done. It's the kind of cry that's, that's, that's uncontrollable. It just it goes on and on. You can't stop it. And the more you think about it and the more you dwell on it, the, the sadder and sadder you get and the more you weep. It's like the tax collector in the parable that just wants to beat his breast, hide his face. It's Peter. In that moment, Peter needed that look from Jesus. And you and I, in the moments when we fail Jesus, when we deny him or betray him, we also need that look from Jesus. And we don't get it like Peter did physically, but we get the look of Jesus every time we're in his word. We get the look tonight. We need that look. And what's in the look? Well, for one, it is disappointment. A God that is angry about what we did. It's a look that, that moves us to, to sorrow and, and deep grieving about what we've done. But, but, it's also a look of compassion and love. It's a look that says, Oh, dear Christian, you who have fallen so deeply, come, return, for the door of mercy is open to you. It's a, it's a look that says, yes, you have failed to listen to your Father's words, but Jesus never did. He always listened to his Father. It's, it's a look that says, yes, you have uh, denied me. You have betrayed me. But Jesus never did. He never denied you. He owned you. He owned you all the way to the cross. It's, it's a look that says, yes, I know that sometimes you have, um, you have failed me. But Jesus never failed. It's, it's a look that says, Sometimes you struggle to 
uh, carry your cross, to endure suffering, and you try to avoid it. But Jesus gladly carried his cross. Jesus uh, carried his cross. He took the punishment. He never avoided suffering. He gladly stepped into suffering. He endured the worst of suffering for you to save you. It's the look that gives you the assurance and confidence that you are loved, you are forgiven, and you are God's child. We need that look from Jesus, just as Peter did. In the movie, uh, Braveheart, later in the movie, uh, Robert the Bruce is talking to his father, and he's uh, he's recalling that moment on the battlefield and, and the look that was in uh, William Wallace's eyes and on his face. And he's also, it's making him think about the man, William Wallace and the man and just how he had loved his country and his countrymen and he had loved Robert and he had served and sacrificed for them. And in that moment, even though it was against what his father wanted, he said, I will, I will never... Uh, side with England again. And I will never betray that man again. And later in the movie, he went out and he led the Scots into battle and they won the battle. Well, if William Wallace and his look can do that for Robert the Bruce, just imagine what the look of your Savior can do for you. And it did it for Peter. Because later, Peter was forgiven and reinstated by Jesus. And he became a leader in the church and an apostle. And he wrote a couple books in the New Testament. What is the look of Jesus through, God, through his word and sacrament? What is it going to do for you? What will God do through you through the look of Jesus? Amen. Amen.